Today I will try to tell you about two extremely widespread engines, diesel engines for 1.5 and 1.6 liters. These engines were installed on a huge number of cars, including on Peugeot 308 in the T9 body. Well then, let us compare them head to head, so to speak, visually and structurally, they are very similar. There is a difference, of course, but nevertheless, these are practically identical twins, especially since the 1.5 is, by and large, built on the 1.6 engine basis. I'll clarify right away. Everything I will say today concerns the engines. It's 120 and 130 horsepower with the DV6FC and DV5RC markings respectively. We've figured that out. Next, both have almost the same engine column and even the diameter of the cylinders is identical. Then come the differences. The 1.6 engine has a longer piston stroke and consequently a larger volume because of this, but that's trivial. The biggest difference comes later and everybody knows about it. It is the number of valves. 1.6 is an 8-valve engine, while 1.5 is a 16-valve engine. Accordingly, 1.6 has one camshaft and 1.5 has two camshafts. The funniest thing is that the engine lifespan is listed on many websites and it is 300,000 kilometers for the 1.5 and only 220,000 kilometers for the 1.6. The joke is that, I suppose it is not a secret for anyone that car mileages in Belarus are twisted massively. And it's not just in Belarus. Often, the same cars with 1.6 are brought to Belarus with an actual mileage of, say, 250 to 300. They wind it back to 130 and, I went to the people and people drive and rejoice and then they spin again and so on. Really, the engine easily runs 3000 without any problems at all. You can confront me with anything, but I am personally confident that the real, relatively trouble-free mileage of these engines is around half a million, considering that they are all wound and rewound. Yes, surely there will be questions about the accessories, but nothing terrible happens. Where did I get such information? The fact is that starting from 2000, sometime around the year 2000, I began to follow the information very closely about the Peugeot 308 in the T9 body, mostly with the 1.6 drive turu engine group in Viber. I didn't just log in, look around and leave. I stay there, read, analyze and so on. All of this is to say that people don't commit any severe crimes at all. Of course, there are environmental problems with the 1.6 or 1.5, but this is Euro 6. Around roughly 200,000 kilometers, problems start to arise, some a little earlier, let's say at 180,000, some a little later at 250,000. The problems are typically minor. Something has become clogged. Something needs to be cleaned. Maybe an injector issue with blue. But as practice has shown, issues don't arrive alone. But gradually, over a year, people experience one issue after another, then a third in terms of ecology. In the end, everyone comes to the conclusion that the ecology needs to be cut out. For us, this costs roughly between $150 to $300 with physical and software removal, which isn't terribly expensive, considering that in attempts to repair the entire system. You can easily spend more. It's up to each individual to decide. A few more words about ecology and the differences between 1.5 and 1.6. In the vehicles, in addition to ATW fluid, there was also IOLIS fluid. And in the 1.5, there is no IOLIS. Why is it even needed at all? If we avoid getting into too much detail, without physics or chemistry, then the engine produces poor exhaust fumes. Something needs to be done about this. Firstly, there was the EGR valve in which exhaust gases that were once in the exhaust system started to partially return and burn in the engine. Then a particulate filter was invented, much like a catalyst. This was a diesel only feature. Harmful large particles are retained in it and later during the burning of this filter, they simply burn out. They then came up with the idea that if you added a special at blue liquid or urea, you could further reduce the amount of harmful substances in the exhaust, but there was a major problem. Remember the soot filter, it has a feature. When it does not allow harmful particles to pass through and filters well, it gets clogged up, and cleaning it again requires the so-called burn mode to be activated. This mode occurs under certain conditions. That is, the engine forcibly increases the fuel supply and the temperature on the exhaust so that all the soot burns off. Here's the problem. On the highway, everything is fine, but many people drive around the city and the engine simply doesn't have time to warm up to the temperature at which it's possible to burn, regenerate. That's where our Iolis fluid comes in. It's designed so that the temperature at which it's possible to regenerate is lower. There's a certain physical and chemical reaction. In other words, it gives a chance to cars that don't only drive on the highway to save the resource of the particulate filter. So on the 1.5 engines, they refuse to use this fluid. It's difficult and ambiguous to say whether it's good or bad. On one hand, they removed one unit and made the system simpler. On the other hand, it's quite possible that by doing so, the manufacturer simply reduced the cost of the system. And the fact that in this case, the particulate filter dies faster, most likely made calculations. So they replayed everything and decided that the warranty period of the particulate filter would pass. They don't need more, of course. Another option is that the whole system was simply reconfigured and EOL's fluid is no longer needed, but personally I don't believe this. I can't confirm anything, but time and specific data will show at what mileages the particulate filters on 1.5 and 1.6 engines fail massively. It'll be interesting to watch. By the way, share in the comments what you think about this. 
We've finished with the environment, next the problems are more serious. 1.5, 130 horsepower, people have dealt with breakdowns of the injection pump. It drove the stream. This is expensive, but it mostly happened under warranty, and at mileages of about 50, 60,000. In Belarus, I haven't heard about such things from anyone. Nevertheless, they say these things happened in Europe, not often, but it did happen. Next, again 1.5 HD, familiar but unpleasant problem, the camshaft chain. It is too thin, it can stretch or even tear, the worst thing is that there are no special symptoms and it can happen without warning. You're driving on the highway and suddenly the engine dies, it's certainly unpleasant. Theoretically, since 2020, cars have started being manufactured with reinforced timing chains. It is also possible to replace this chain under warranty in Europe. There have been quite a number of cases where the car was still under warranty in Europe, the chain broke and people had to change the engine. Quite an unpleasant situation. The data on this varies. Some say the valves get bent, others say they don't. I cannot make any certain claims. I won't assert what solutions exist to tackle the issue, whether to buy a kit to switch to a reinforced chain or something else, but it's the order of around $800 or so, or whenever the timing pump is replaced, also change this chain together with the tensioner, which will also lighten your pocket by an additional approximately $300. This is the cost of the tensioner chain. A full set of timing with a pump, seals and copper washers for injectors will cost a little less than $600. This is only the prices of parts plus respective work. Well, somehow like that, I also found information on one Belarusian resource that if you have a reinforced chain, then there will be an engraving on the camshaft cover there will be an engraving with a code that is shown on the screen. If I'm not getting anything mixed up, it looks like, based on the photo, the number can be found right here. If I'm wrong, correct me. As for the problems with the 1.6 engine, it's hard to pinpoint anything specifically. Any quirks that are present on the 1.6? Well, for example, at high mileage, the thermostat might leak. If anything, it's not a widespread occurrence, it's just that the thermostat is quite expensive. So, give me a couple of years and I'm certain the same issues will surface with the 1.5, so everything that is with the 1.6 is child's play compared to the 1.5. You can watch this video, there are timestamps. Rewind to the engine part to avoid repetition. Unfortunately, let's approach the issue from a different angle. Assume we have a major breakdown. What would be the assembly cost for both 1.5 and 1.6 engines? In the context of fall 2023, the cost of the 1.6 HDI engine is around $1,500. The configuration, condition, mileage, warranty, these factors are important to call and confirm, however. For a 1.5 engine, the price may range to about $2,000 or even $2,500, technically making it twice as expensive. Additionally, the offerings for the older 1.6 engine are significantly more compared to the 1.5 engine. Again, this isn't a hint, just some information to mull over. Okay, you might say that buying a motor and immediately thinking about replacing it is somehow unreasonable. No questions. Let's see, for instance, how much some expensive parts cost for one engine and another. Let's start with the injectors. So, the prices, whether for 1.6 or 1.5, they're about the same, which is around 140 $150 for a used injector, it just costs more for the 1.6 options, which are several times higher. The fuel injection pump for the 1.6 engine has many options. Prices range from $50 to $250 to suit any taste and color. As for the 1.5, prices range from $150 to $380, and options are really few, just two. Well, for example, the turbine situation is similar, there are more options for the 1.6. And a small turbine, prices start from $100 and end at around $200. On the 1.5, there are fewer options, but they at least exist. The prices are roughly $250 to $300 for used ones, and about $350 to $380 for a new turbine. And one more detail that I think is worth mentioning when talking about the 1.5 engine is the fuel filter, or rather, its location. It's located near the fuel tank below. On the one hand, well, what's wrong with that? So many cars are like that. On the other hand, if you're not aware in the context of the Peugeot 308, the seating position is extremely low, and if you load the car, it's straight up painful. So here it doesn't seem to me that this aspect is too far-fetched, but you might disagree with me. Well, alright, somehow a video turned out about how I don't like the 1.5 and what a good, wonderful one point. Let's find the pros in the new Advanced 1.5 HD. But firstly, if we're talking about the 130 horsepower version, then it's 10 horses more powerful, which is always nice. The second, fuel consumption by the manual on the 1.5, it's about half a liter less. And I understand this parameter depends heavily on how you drive, but all other things equal, let's say the 1.5 on the highway, will probably be more economical than the 1.6, a small thing, but pleasant. The third plus is the AdBlue fluid, or rather its cap, has finally been moved under the gas cap. This is unequivocal, better, more comfortable. Well, let's draw some conclusions here. 
As you probably inferred, when head-to-head, -head, the 1.5 significantly loses, it's much more expensive to maintain, there's a risk of encountering major issues with the chain. With more or less serious engine repairs, there are significantly fewer parts, and the prices are strikingly higher. The common problems with these engines are consistent. I'm referring to the environment here. The 1.5 engine, in fact, has only one irrefutable advantage, and that is, it's newer. Yes, now 1.6 looks good and cheerful. But 5, 10 years will pass, and these 308s will become well, old people. Here is the 308, let's say, with engines, albeit 1.5, but 5 years younger. This is already something. The fact is that the 1.6 was installed on the 308 Peugeot, if we are talking about it, until 2019, with the caveat that it still needs to be found. There are negligible options for such cars and then only 1.5 when starting from 2017. That is, you cannot buy 1.6 2020 model year. Yes, even in 2019, there will be only a few cars with a 1.6 engine of the same year, but with 1.5, say, well, 20 times more. Once again, since 2017, Restyled 308S with 1.5 engines have been produced. Along the way, Restyled 308S were produced, but with 1.6 engines from 2017 to 2019. But there are very, very few of them every year. If there are, for example, four options with 1.6, then with 1.5 there will be 150 or 200 of them. So, about these numbers, and what to do in a situation like this. From the perspective of a layman and an armchair expert, which is me, the best option in 2023, or maybe 2024, would be a restyled 308 Peugeot with a 1.6 engine. You can find ones up until 2019 if you look hard enough. Personally, I'm quite disappointed that the French couldn't create a 1.5 engine that's just as good as the excellent small 1.6 diesel, without exaggerating, of course. Despite this, one cannot simply write this off as failure. Lots of people drive them, they're happy with them, and everything seems fine. The biggest issue with this engine is pretty much the chain, otherwise it's okay. And as for its current cost of maintenance, you probably won't be surprised if I tell you that all new or relatively new engines cost relatively the same. There's just a minor correction and difference. This 1.5 engine has virtually no hiccups, except for the chain mentioned earlier. But with other engines, things can get quite messy. If you don't believe me, just look around or do some reading. And that's about it. That's all I've got for today.